by God. Well, what does that mean? Or why should we allow our life to be guided by God? I know we talk about whenever we, you know, we say somebody accepts Christ in their life, and what does that really mean? For a lot of people, I think, that meaning is, is that they come up and they make some type of profession of faith at some point in their life, meaning that they chose heaven over hell. That's the decision that they feel like. I know whenever I made it at nine years old, that was what I was making. There was a choice. You can go to a bad place when you die, or you can go to a good place when you die. And the majority of the people that you ask that question, if they wanted to be honest with themselves, they're not going to choose the bad place over the good place. They're going to want to go to the good place. But that's not how it works. If it's just choosing a good place over a bad place, the majority of people is going to go to heaven. Because most people don't want to go to a bad place. I mean, there are some people, you could argue the point that there are some people, even on their deathbed, they're tickled to death that they're going to meet Satan. I mean, there's people that do that. But the majority of people don't want to go to a place called hell. They want to go to a place called heaven. But see, I think we have this misconception, and I've talked about it before, that it is just a profession of faith. And it is just a prayer that we pray. And it is just one snapshot in our life and that's the end of story when no it's not there's a whole lot more to it than that God has to move into our life and we're supposed to allow him to guide us and lead us now I'd like to say and I've said it before I wish that everything that I did God was the center of it but he's not there's many decisions that I make that I don't include God in but I should. I know there's decisions that I've made that I didn't include my wife in. It didn't work out too good for me. And God is ranked up higher than what she is. And we say, well, I don't have to ask God for everything. Well, no, you don't have to ask God for everything, but he wants us to. He wants us to ask him everything. I think about as my boys was growing up, as the older that they get, the less that they ask me. Does that make me happy? No. I wish they asked me more. And there's a point that you get in your life whenever they don't ask you nothing no more. I've not got there yet. But I'm sure that it's coming. Whenever they already know whatever it is, or they don't want to include you because they don't want you to know what the problem was. I almost think we do that with God. We don't want God to know the mess that we're in, or we don't want God to be a part of the decision. Why? Because we already know the answer he's probably going to give us. Most of the time, whenever my boys ask me a question, they already know the response they're going to get. That's why they may choose to ask me, or not ask me, or ask their mom versus me, or vice versa, because they already know the answer they're going to get. If we have a relationship with Christ, we already know the answer we're going to get majority of the time. That's why we don't ask. What is it they say? It's easier to ask for permission, I mean, ask for forgiveness than permission. And, and I really believe that we do that as Christians. We ask for forgiveness because we didn't want to ask for permission, but we knew at the time we was going to have to ask for forgiveness down the road sometime. So a life that we want to be guided by God why is that? Why should we trust in God? Is it because that he saved us from our sins? Is it because that's just what the church tells us to do? You know, what is the reason that we do it? But I think there's some facts the reason why we should do it. Whenever we look at the scripture and we determine who God is, and I think we still make God a lot smaller than what he is. Um, I've tried in my own mind to think about how, not necessarily physically, but how big God is. When I think about, when you look at the universe that we live in, that he created, and as far as we know, they may be multiple universes, meaning it just keeps going because we keep finding things all the time. Now, I have to just guess at it or whatever. I just go by what they tell me because I have never looked in anything and seen past the moon that I can see out here and maybe whenever I was in school, I may have seen Jupiter, and they told me it was Jupiter. I don't know if it's Jupiter or not. You see what I'm saying? I have to go by somebody else's word. 
But God put it all out there whether I say it's there or not. And think about that. And then whenever he looks down, I almost picture us as like we just came back from the beach. And I look down on that beach and all that sand down there. There's no way that I can tell you how many pieces of sand they are. Just underneath my feet. And that's almost how I think it is when God looks down. Not that he's not that we're not important. But it's just like a bunch of pieces of sand, all these stars and stuff. There's just millions of them. So how big is he when he created something that large? He didn't just create the little piece that we've got here. There's all kinds of other stuff that's out there. Now, I'm not telling you there's other worlds just like this. I'm, not, I'm just saying when we look at the space and we look at what we have and what he's using, he's rather large. Not just physically. In Psalms chapter 37 verse 23 it says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his ways. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. So what is he saying? He's saying that a good man is listening to God, and God is placing his feet where he wants them, and that man's not placing them where he wants them. God is taking each step for you, or he's showing you where to put each step instead of you placing the steps where you want it. You know, we, we talk about driving, and we're supposed to be in the passenger seat and let God drive. My guess is most of us in here are driving our ship. Rarely are we in the passenger seat. At best, I'm a guessing that we're in the driver's seat and we're just asking for directions. You know, there's a song that came out and people sung it in church, and, and I'm not being negative one way or the other, but it wasn't intended to be a Christian song, I don't believe. But it's Jesus Take the Wheel. Well, see, I don't think it actually works that way. If you listen to the song, the tragedy happened because of bad choices that they made and that's whatever they throw up their arms and say, Jesus, get me out of the mess I'm in. That's how we want to perceive God, how he works. As we're driving our ship or we're driving our car, whatever you want to call it, and when we get ourselves in a mess to where we can't no longer control what we're in, we just throw up our hands and say, Jesus, you take the wheel. Now you control. We want you to control it because we can't no more. But up until the point where I'm in control, I want to control it all the time. That's basically what we're saying. When God doesn't want to work that way. He says if you want to not have the tragedy to come into your life, if you don't want this to happen, then you need to let me drive. Let me be the one that's guiding the wheel instead of you driving the wheel. I don't just come by and fix the problems that you have. We talked about several years ago, and I hope that I speak on that again because I love that message, and I'd like to get a little bit more in depth. The difference between scabs and scars. But to have either one, that means that a tragedy happened. A scab means that it's still healing. A scar means that it has healed, but there's limitations, and it has changed. See, a lot of times, I think for most things, we can eliminate the scab and the scar if we just let him be in control. And why is that? He tells us in Psalms chapter 37 that a good man, or I think a better translation is a wise man, is ordered by, his steps are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Let me go over to And I know I've read this scripture probably a hundred times here, and I'll probably read it a hundred more, I guess. But in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, it says, this I say then, walk in the Spirit. Now, you can say you're doing the walking. What walk in the Spirit means, just to go back, is what we were talking about again. 
walking in the spirit is I'm doing the walking, but the spirit's telling me where to step. So when I get up in the morning, the first thing I do is I'm asking God, where do you want me to do today? Where do you want me to go? Who do you want me to talk to? I'll just do whatever it is that you place before me. Now you say, well, I got to go to work. Well, yeah, you got to go to work. And I think God knows that we got to work because he's the one that placed that on us. You say, well, I don't. Yeah, you do. That was part of the punishment for the sinfulness of man. We're going to have to eat by the sweat of our brow. We've got to work. It don't just show up in our yard. The squash and the cabbage and the, the green beans and the, all that other stuff, it don't just show up in our yard. We've got to earn it by the sweat of our brow. So we've got to have jobs. And God understands that. God knows what he's working with. But if you say, God, I want you to use me today, if it's at work, if whatever it is, that's what he's saying is that the spirit is you're walking in the spirit. God, tell me what you want me to do today. I'm not going to have any preconceived notion that I'm going to do this and that, and I'm not going to be one of these that if, if I know that I've got to be a meeting at 530 or I've got to be here at church at 530 and I'm riding down the road and you tell me to pull into somebody's house and witness to them, that I say, well, I've got to be there at 530, which is more important. If God's leading you to do something, I think that's the most important thing at the time. But if we do that, he says, if we walk in the Spirit, it says we shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So first of all, if we just do what the Spirit tells us, the Holy Spirit, now he's talking in this scripture, hail both of them, to a child of God. You can't walk in the Spirit if you're a lost person. Maybe that's why things are like they are in churches today. It's because we can't even do it. First, we have to be saved in order to walk in the Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit guiding and directing us. We do not receive the Holy Spirit until we accept Christ in our life. It says, if we walk in the Spirit, we shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But you know, it's mankind for us to think that our destiny is in our own hands. And I've said it before. We have pounded that into our kids' brains over the last 20 years. In my lifetime, even whenever I was a child in high school, you can be anything that you want to be. And I believe that's probably true. But is anything that you want to be what God wants you to be? Because I'm sure if Ken had chose what he wanted to be, he would have retired at UPS as a supervisor. And probably been done 20, 15 years ago. But that wasn't what God's plan was for Ken. See, God's plan for Ken was is that you leave a good paying job with good benefits and go to a little country church and preach the gospel. Just using that for an example. See, in a mind like mine, that sounds crazy to do that. I think about Tyler and Jenny that they're getting ready to bring her. They was at the time they were getting ready to, they just got married and it wasn't too long after that they were going to be bringing a child in this world. And they were going to a country that if they found out what they're there for, they'd just kill them. And I know there's probably many people that said that's probably one of the craziest things. Why are you not going to college for some career? Why are you not doing this so you could support your family? Why are you taking your wife? that's getting ready to have a child to a country that if they find out that you're a Christian, they would just kill you. You see, the average person can't understand that. It's because why? Because that's what Christ wanted them to do. That's walking in the Spirit. Because mankind, it's not, it is our human nature for us to be able to create our own destiny you know we think we need to carefully plan every part of our life men especially need to be in control meaning it they can always fix it I guess out of most of the things that's happened in my life is whenever it's something that I couldn't fix when you get placed in a situation where you can't fix the problem that's in, uh, before you 
whether it be something that's happening to somebody that it's physically or emotionally or even spiritually and you can't fix it, that's probably one of the most frustrating things for me. If we can just fix it, then let's just do it. Whatever it takes, let's make it happen. But when you can't fix it, that's very frustrating. But that's why we have God instead of just us. Because God can fix it. Now, he can choose not to, and that's totally up to him. Because there's a reason, and we'll get to that here in a minute. But also, the Bible says in Jeremiah 10, verse 23, it says, O Lord, I know that the ways of man is not himself. It is not in man that walketh to wreck his steps. O Lord, correct me, but with judgment, not in thine anger, lest you bring me to nothing. Now, he was understanding that God's in control and that God can and he will. He's saying, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to correct his steps. It's not that we should be doing that. It should be God doing it. But he says, Lord, correct me. When I'm not letting you control my life. Now this is one of them prayers that you don't really want to be praying unless you want it to be answered. Because he's giving him two choices here at the end. And he's, he's telling him, I know you can do both, but I'm asking for one. He said, Lord, correct me, but with judgment, not in thine anger. Lest thou bring me to nothing. God has the power to bring you to nothing. And that was what he was asking. Judge me, but don't do it in anger. It's kind of like whenever you have your kids and they do something really bad. You've got to do something about it. But I'm sure they're sitting there thinking, I don't want what I'm getting ready to get. But I know you're going to do something. And that's basically what he's asking. I know you've got to do something because it needs to be fixed. But just calm down a little bit, you know. But he understood that. But God guides the steps of his children if we allow him to do it. And he's going to want to do it. So I'm going to give you three reasons why I think we should do that. Because whenever... Let, let's just say, let's use for an example today when this accident happened out here. When it first happened, somebody had to call 911 and say, hey, there's a problem out here that we can't fix. There's a bad problem and we need somebody come that can do something about it. Well, when the first people get there, they realize that there's not something that they can do. They can't handle that, so that's whenever they're waiting on the ambulance to get there. Then when the ambulance gets there, they know that it's not the best thing for the ambulance to deal with it, so they call for a helicopter so they can get them to somewhere as quick as possible so they can deal with the circumstance. See, first we've got to realize who's in control and that we need help with it. See, if the first person that showed up said, you know what, I can just fix it, and they just started doing stuff and it caused more harm than what it did good, what good did it do? And so I'm afraid that we do that as Christians a lot of times. We try to fix our own thing. And we just make a big mess of it. We already made a mess because we're in the situation. Now we just create a bigger mess because we're trying to fix it. Whenever we need to rely on God and say, God, help me with this. But first of all, God, don't never let me get in it to begin with. So the first thing is, is why should we seek God and why should we let him guide our life is because God sees all. God sees it all. Ken has probably painted the best picture that I can, in my mind, that I can remember. Never really thought about it till Ken preached it many, many years ago about everything is in present tense to God. He sees everything at one time. See, to me, that's hard for me to fathom. You know, I, I can't even hardly remember what happened yesterday, much less, you know, 
It's hard for me to even know what's going on now. But he sees everything from beginning to end, not just for our little old group, but for every group that's here and every group that's ever lived and every one that's going to live. So he sees it all at one time. He sees the whole big old picture. So God sees it all. He has a vision that is not limited. But we can't do that. We don't know what's hiding around the corner. It's like I've said before, you know, you're riding down the road, you run over a nail and you have a flat and you pull over to the side and you've got to change a tire and you're busy and you needed to go and do something. And we're complaining about having to change a tire. The reason why we're changing the tire might be because if we'd kept going down the road, we'd have been in an accident. We don't know. God knows what's coming around the corner, and he takes and shields us, and it might not be that he just stops the other vehicle. It might be that he slows our vehicle down to where we don't ever get to the corner. See, he can see what's happening around the corner. He's the one that knows it all. He sees it all. In James chapter 4, verse 14, he says, You know not what shall be on the morrow. We don't. But guess who does? He does. In Luke chapter 12, verse 7, it says, He even knows how many hairs is on our head. And I know it's a joke. It don't have to count too much on mine. But you know what? He still knows all of them. And for whatever reason, he chose to put that many on there. You know, he just chose to put more on other people. But God knows all those things. You know, he even talks about it, even there's not a sparrow that falls to the ground that God don't even know about. He, he don't, he knows it all. You know, it used to be a thing if, remember whenever I was in school, a question that if, if a tree falls in the middle of the forest and nobody's around, does it make a sound? Well, my guess is it makes a vibration. I don't know if it makes a sound. I'm guessing it does, but God knows it'll happen. We don't have to see it. We don't have to know it, but God knows it all. When those rocks fall out of the sky, those meteors, God knows all about that. He knew it way before it was ever going to happen. See, none of these things come as a surprise to God because he sees it all and he knows it all as far as the seeing it. He sees everything at once, as I was talking. So the first thing is, is why should we rely on him? Is because he sees it all. He can keep us from taking the wrong path. Why? Because he already knows what's going to take place. He sees it ahead of us. He sees the tragedy. Just like a kid out in the parking lot we've talked about before, they're not paying attention to the car that's coming down the road. They're just paying attention to the ball that just bounced out in the road. But see, we as adults, we're probably watching the car more than we are the ball. Because we know we can replace the ball. We can't replace the kid that's going after the ball. See, that's the way God is. He's, he's seeing all those things. He's seeing the big picture, and he sees that we're getting ready to run across the road for a ball that we don't need to run across the road. And he keeps us from doing it sometimes. And the more we rely on him, the more he's going to give us that guidance. Because I believe if we ask him for it, you say, well, is tragedy ever going to come if I always rely on God? Yes, tragedy still will come. Believe it or not, all of us are still going to have to die. People say, well, he didn't heal my daddy. He didn't heal my mama. He didn't heal my grandma. He didn't heal my kids. I don't know why, but he does. And if we believe that to die is gain, then does it matter? I know it does because we're earthly. But whenever we take our last breath here, it's not going to matter no more. So first of all, he sees it all. The second one is that God knows it all. See, I think when we read that Romans, let me read it, Romans 8, 28, which is a very familiar scripture. 
where it says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. To me, that's when we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, all things work together for good. Can we choose to be a mess in it? Yes. If I go out here and I choose to kill somebody, I don't think God's necessarily wanting me to do that so he can use that for good. He ends up doing it. But he didn't want me to do that so he could do that. Because of me, that would be evil. He don't want me to do that. But he gave me free will and I got to choose to do it. And I choose to do it. Now, he may make something good out of what happened. And we see tragedies that things like that happen. But God knows it all. There's many things, I think, in just in my lifespan that I've had in the last 49 years that I still don't understand. God's not gave me an answer that why it happened. I just have to understand that he's in control. I don't like some of the things that happen, but I see some things that happen, and I see the good part that come out of it. But God knows all. Just as he could see everything, he also knows all the things that are going on. What do we call that? Omniscient. The definition of that is the state of having total knowledge, the quality of knowledge of everything. Not the majority of things, not some things, but everything. He knows all. There's nothing that he has to learn. There's nothing he did learn. He knows it all. He don't have something that's going to, like I said, catch him by surprise. He understands it all. He started it all, and we don't have to second guess whether he knows what to do about the situation or not. See, now, if you come to me and you ask me for guidance, you may have it in your mind or you may not, but you're going to have to think, does Alvin even know what he's talking about? There may be some things that you ask me that you may have more confidence than others, but whenever you ask me something, there still could be that question in your mind, does he even know what he's talking about, even if he gives me an answer? But see, when we ask God, it don't matter what the question is. He has the answer. And we know that it's the right answer. We don't have to second guess him. Why does he have this quality of all knowing cash? Why does he have that? It's because that's part of what makes him a sovereign God. Because he's not just over us. He's over everything. Remember I was talking about all those little, if they want to call it Jupiter and Pluto and Mars and Saturn and all, you know, because they told me some that was there whenever I was growing up in school and they tell them now that it's not there really. But it doesn't matter if it's there or not. He created it. It is there. And he knows it's there, and he knows why it's there. You know, I got to reading, and me and Ryan were talking about this the other day. It's kind of crazy. We were taking a class the other day, and we have to use a, a compass, and we doing all these things. That's kind of what spurred it up in my mind. Is See, when you use a compass, and it, it tells you that it's due north, meaning that you're using a magnetic compass, not an electronic, but a magnetic compass. Right now in the state of North Carolina, it's about 8 degrees off. If I go to Alaska, it's about 20 degrees off. See, I didn't know that before I took that class. I thought if it said north, that's north. That's true north. But it's not. Well, why is that? Because this thing that we're sitting on called the earth shouldn't even be sitting here. Now, people say, you know, that, you know, I think we sing a little song how he has the whole world in his hands. I believe literally he does. Because scientifically, this thing shouldn't even stay where it's at. Have you ever, you ever had one of those little spin top things that you just take your fingers and you spin it like that and it drops down on the floor and as long as that thing's spinning perfectly and going pretty fast, that thing will spin forever. But once that thing just starts to wobble just the least little bit, it don't take it long until that thing's done. 
It don't matter how fast it's spinning. Once it starts wobbling, it just goes off. Well, see, we can't feel it, but this thing's off. The earth is wobbling. It is not on a center axis and spinning in a perfect axis. It wobbles back and forth between 22.1 and 24.5 degrees. It's three degrees off. And it changes. It's sitting there doing this. And by all rights, it shouldn't even stay in place. And then we wonder why it stays in place. That's because there's somebody greater than us that put it there to start with. And that's why he wants it to work that way. I don't understand why he wants it to do that. But it does. Now, there's all kinds of people that have different scenarios about it, but there's no consensus on it other than the consensus is that it's doing it. There is no argument that it's not doing it. It's just why is it doing it. And they say it's getting worse now because all the glaciers are melting and that we're getting farther away from the sun or we're getting closer to the sun. I don't know. I don't even know that it's wobbling other than they tell me it is. But if it is, it shouldn't be. And even the people that don't believe God's in control think that thing's wobbling. And it shouldn't be doing it. See, every time you look at something, how could there not be somebody that put it all together? Now, I'm not saying we don't evolve. Because we can just take and look at the people that we know, and we've evolved. There's people on this earth that are shorter because of the regions they live in. There's people that are taller because of the regions they live in. People have different skin colors. They have different attributes because of the region that they lived in because they needed to. They have evolved. But we all started from the same, which was from a man called Adam. But God knows everything. And you can read that in 1 John chapter 3, verse 20. He knows all the little details, everything around us. And that's where it talks about the sparrows in Matthew chapter 10. But there's also something else in Isaiah chapter 46. See, now, I don't mind God knowing everything. You know, I, I can almost think about it as if God's got this camera that he's just watching us all the time. You know, we got cameras here at the church in a couple of places, and sometimes we forget you're there, and you might act dumb or whatever, and then somebody say, well, you know, why'd you do that or something? So I can even imagine that maybe God's got some kind of a camera or something, if you want to look at it in that aspect, that he kind of knows what we're doing. And in Isaiah chapter 46 and verse 9, it says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. From the beginning, he's saying, to the very end, he understands it all. There is no in-between. There is nothing um, let me look at another scripture here. In Psalms 139, verse 4, it says, For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. I take that as there's been times that I have bit my tongue. Matter of fact, there's been times here at church that I've bit my tongue when I wanted to say something and I didn't say something. And there's times whenever I've wanted to say something and I definitely shouldn't have said what I was going to say. Not necessarily here at church, but other places. See, I think God even knows what's getting ready to come off my tongue before it comes off. But also, I had a scripture wrote down and I cannot find it right now. It's left me. It 
where he talks about he even knows our thoughts and I cannot think of where it's at right now. But he even knows the thoughts that we have. We don't even have to. I don't know about you, but my thoughts is probably the worst part about me. Because I think about things that I never act on. I think about things that I shouldn't ever think about. And nobody ever knows about it. It's just me. It'd be nice if God didn't know about them, but he does. He knows all those things. So God knows everything. And he sees all. But also there's something else he does. God has all power. Now, I think we would like to think, because here on earth, we see a lot of evidence of Satan having a lot of power. There's no doubt Satan has a lot of power. But God has a lot more power than Satan does. Satan only can do what God allows him to do. Nobody controls God. God does what he wants that word of all power is omniscient. And it comes from the meaning is the omni means all, and then potent means power. And that God is infinite. And if he's sovereign, and we know he is, then we must, he must be omniscient. He has power over all things. I was talking to somebody, and they said, well, okay, if God has power and he can do anything he wants to do, and I, I, I believe he does. They said, well, you say that God can't lie. Then that means he can't do that. So he's not omniscient. I said, well, yeah, he can lie if he wanted to, but he's chose not to. You say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, if there's a little baby laying over here in a crib, I could walk over there and I could choke the baby out. I could suffocate it with a pillow. I could do whatever I wanted to because I have the power to do it. But I've chose not to do it. Just because I chose not to do it doesn't mean that I don't have the power to do it. It just means I choose not to use that power. I don't think God's ever lied based on the scripture. But could he? I guess he could. If he has all power, he could. But he's chose not to do that. Just like Christ chose to come to this earth and relinquish his powers. Because if Christ knew everything, whenever he came to earth, why did it say that he learned as he was here? See, he had to relinquish some things whenever he came to earth. God has all power. And not just him, but Christ has it and the Holy Spirit has it. It's not just the Father. They all three have it. Now they have different duties, but they all have all power. They're a powerful force. But you know, there's other powerful forces. Humans are powerful. We see them do crazy stuff, and they do a lot of mean things, and they can do a lot of powerful things. Take one leader and kill a whole country. Demons. I believe there's a lot of demon-possessed people today, and they have a lot of power because they're doing a lot of things today. We don't give them credit for that. And they work against what God wants to do, but God has that control. He's chose to give it to them. But Job spoke of that power in Job chapter 42, verse 2. Let me just turn there right quick. Job chapter 42, verse 2. And we're just about done. But your kids are probably eating right now, and they don't want us to be done, probably. Job chapter 42 and verse 2, it says, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought, can be withholding from thee. He can do anything 
and there's nothing that we think or anything that we goes through our mind that we can withhold from him. We can't, we're, we can't stop it. God knows it all. And he has all power. But when we think about that omniscient thing, I think if, for me, I, I believe that God has all power. And we've talked about that several times over the last couple of years because of COVID and different things. And we've always said that God's in control. And then, you know, we kind of sometimes wishy-washy back and forth, even in our own lives. You know, it's real easy for me to say that God's in control whenever I'm telling you about your life and about your problem and about your instances. But whenever it comes to my house and whenever it's dealing with my problem, it's hard for me to really comprehend that God can take care of all those things. Because I've had that experience in my own life. But then whenever I look at all the things that God has done, and if there's one thing in the whole Bible that shows to me the power of God, more so than things that I've even seen in my own life. Would be if we turn over to the beginning of the book. In Genesis chapter 1. When it says in the first verse of Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning God created the heavens and earth. And in the earth was without form and void. And the darkness upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now listen to what verse 3 says. Remember what I was talking about, this big old humongous universe that we have. We have this universe that I believe is part of this scripture because when it talks about it, it's more than just this little earth and the sun source that we have, the moon at night and the sun during the day. It's all these stars and all these things, and some of those stars are plumb out and we can't even tell where they're at. Some of those stars are so far away, which I can't comprehend. They're so far away, if they burn out, it'll take us 50, 60 years before we ever see that it was burned out. Because the light travels that distance. It can burn out 50 years ago, and we're still seeing the light from it because it ain't got to us the part that ain't lit yet. So that just tells us how big it is. But this is what he said in verse 3. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. All he had to do was speak it. All he had to do was speak it. And I think about all the things that men have done here on this earth. We can go back to the Tower of Babel. And I think the Tower of Babel was probably the first huge creation that men were making that was a problem. Because what were they doing? They was crying to create. They were going to heaven. In Jesus. Today, we can go to the moon. We've sent things to Mars. But we have to create it with tools. We have to create it with things that we didn't even create. We have to use somebody else's stuff to make it. We didn't make it ourselves. God just spoke it into existence. So when we look at that power, also in verse 6, and God said, let there be firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. He just spoke it again. We taught this in Vacation Bible School. There's something very unique about us as humans when it comes to creation. All these things that he did, he just spoke them into existence. But we're a little different. I think about all this mass stuff that we have, and God just spoke, and it just happened. I don't know if it happened instantly. My guess is it did. I think it just poofed. I think it happened. But in verse 26, it said, And God said, Let us make man in our own image. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he them, male and female. He created them, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. And that is not the scripture I was wanting to read. 
Here it is. I wanted to read that, but also I wanted to continue on. It's over in chapter 2. And we'll start in verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. He formed man of the dust of the ground, and then he breathed into our nostrils. He didn't just speak us into existence. God has all this power, but he chose to form us by hand and to make us. God is all powerful. So when we look at it, why should we listen to God? He sees it all. He knows it all. He has all power and he created it all. So if we had a problem, why would we not go to the source that made it all? If I'm driving a Ford and I have a Ford problem, I don't want to go to the Toyota guy to ask about it. If you had the ability, you would go to the guy that created it. You want to go to the person that has the knowledge about it. So why would we not want to go to God because he created it all? And he has the answer. Just like if me and Ken have a problem with each other. I can go to Ken and we can work the problem out. But if I go to Alan to try to work out the problem between me and Ken, it doesn't work out that well. But see, I think we try to do that too much. So we have a problem that God can fix, but we want to go to everybody else to get it fixed instead of to the source, which is God. And there's parts in the Bible too, and I don't want to get into that, but it talks about as Christians, when we have problems with Christians, we ain't supposed to go to the world for the world to fix it either. Me and Ken were talking about just yesterday going up the road, and it's one of those things that kind of drive me crazy. People want these church weddings, and they want a preacher to preach your wedding, and they want to be married in the name of God and all that, but as soon as some problem happens, they don't go to the preacher. They don't go to the church to try to help and fix the problem. They just go to the court system and get a divorce. I don't think they ought to be able to do that. I think the church ought to give them the divorce or not. You're supposed to try to work it out before you just say quits. If you want to get married, there's all kinds of places you can get married. You can go on online for $25 and be able to marry somebody. You don't have to be a preacher to marry anybody. If you want to just get married, there's all kinds of people who can marry you. But when you ask God's man to put you together, I think there's more to it. Maybe I'm old-fashioned, but I just think a little bit different, I guess. Sometimes it's a bad thing, sometimes it's not. Anybody have anything they want to add or comment? Or and I'm not saying that God don't have all power. I'm just saying that I do believe it. When you look at Christ came to this earth as a babe, when he was a baby, he didn't have the power that he had whenever he ascended. He had to relinquish to be able to come and be a man to be a human. He bled just like we bled. He hurt just like we hurt. There's a lot to that too that I'm going to just give you a quick gist. I just don't want to confuse nobody that Jesus is not our powerful. He was, but he gave up rights while he was here.
And it is a dot. When you look at the big, big picture, it's a dot. You know, we're one of them things, if you think about it, us as humans, if you was looking under it under a universe microscope, you wouldn't even see us. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you wouldn't even notice us. But like those attributes, God placed all those things on himself. God has all power, but he said, you know what? I'm going to go by a certain set of rules if you want to look at it that way, and I'm not going to do these things. But God is, he is, um, but that's why people are going to go to hell. It's because of the rules that he set. And he can't break them just because he wants to. Anybody else have anything? Thank you for that. Yeah. There's only two paths. I know there's a lot of paths being taught today. That's another thing I'm studying is this new modern age thing. But uh, it don't matter how many paths anybody tells you, it ain't two paths. You can have a thousand paths on the other side because it says it's broad as the way. There can be a million paths to hell, but there's only one path to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. There's only one. It is amazing because if we think about it, this earth, if it had been just a little bit closer to the sun, it wouldn't have sustained life. If it had been a little bit farther out, it wouldn't have sustained life. You say, well, we could have just been on the next planet over. No. Neither one of those planets would have worked either. So this, this all was put together by somebody. Whether you want to believe in the Christ that we believe in or not, something had to put all this together. It didn't just happen because two single-cell organisms just happened to get up together one time and start creating all this. I know. And this is just a little drip in the bucket as to what eternity is. We think this lasts forever, but no, it's, this is just a little drip in the bucket. <laughs>